I've learned a lot about deer hunting this fall. I've been hunting now for about 45 years. You get to a point where you think you know it all, and then you get a son who just kicks your butt because he does it so much better than you do. It's, it's ironic. It's that lesson that you all learn, and like, yeah, I thought you are a pretty smart guy, and then your son comes along and says, no, you got this wrong, Dad. I enjoy it, though, because I'm at an age where just doing it, you know, that's the fun of it. It's not really about killing the deer. It's about learning about the habits of the deer, knowing that the deer doesn't do things because you think it needs to do it, because the deer does it, because that's what the deer does. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't get any better than this. On this episode of Meat Eater Hunts, I'm in South Central Wisconsin bow hunting whitetail with my father. You all know him as Papa Giannis, but I call him Tatis, which is father in Latvia. This trip is a bit nostalgic for me since I grew up hunting this property with my dad and his friends. They are some of my earliest hunting mentors and I would not be the hunter nor the person I am today without them. You know, sometimes he talks about people who are his mentors. I don't think I was too much of a mentor other than I taught him about kill bottles. What's a little, little shot you take after you get a deer. Although I've hunted here off and on for the last two decades, it's always been for just a few days around the rifle opener. This is the first time I'm taking a serious approach to hunting the rut here with my bow. Before we kick things off, I stopped by the Vortex headquarters to meet with Mark Boardman and a few other Vortex employees to talk about the current state of the whitetail rut. Yep. I think, you know, I mean, it's definitely a lot warmer this week. I'd say uncharacteristically warm than it is historically. Last year, yeah. we're talking like below 10, like get, yep, six inches of snow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we have know. highs near 70. Yeah. yeah, yeah, today is a near record, like mm -hmm. warm. If the high temps affect him at all this week, what do you think it'll do? I could maybe see some midday activity dwindling a little bit, yeah. but you know, you say that and it'll be 2 p.m. and you have the biggest buck you ever see stroll by, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. We have a lot of ridges where we're hunting in high winds. Do you like, do you stay on the ridges or do you get down out of the wind a little bit? Leeward side of the ridge, halfway down, you get high winds. And I think in hill country, like we're in that, like here, the, the bedding becomes way more predictable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that can definitely work in your favor, right? You can eliminate half the hill that you want to be hunting on. So. Well, thanks for the tips, man. Yeah, no, no. I'll, uh, I'll keep you guys posted. Yeah, cool. good luck. Yeah, let us know how you do. I will. The evening before the hunt, we look through the most recent trail cam photos and study the map one last time. Here's the interesting deer. Yeah, this is a cool old palmated Palmated. Mass. Extra points. Old deer. I don't know many guys that would pass that one up. Certainly not me. Just sitting around this long table brings back memories. I was 12 years old the first time I attended this hunting camp. Exactly 30 years ago, I sat here and got my first lessons in Zuolet, a Latvian trick-taking card game. All right, well, let's get some rest. And uh, yeah, if you're gonna be in the tree an hour before daylight, Oh, I think you got to get up at four. Four, I think so. Well, I just can't believe it's finally here. We're hunting finally. All right, well, sh shall we get up? Shall we get up? Let's do it. Just in case your Latvian is a little rusty, we interviewed my hunting mentors to help with translation and provide historical background. Shall you got him? Uh, is, is is Latvian for sh shoot past, or it, it, it's like when you, when you go hunting, the uh, it's like saying break a leg. In the last 20 years, I've really only hunted this property a total of 20 days or so. I recall the basic layout, but I'm not intimately familiar with it. I'm hoping to change that with a little bit of exploring. But first, 
I'm hunting a spot that I've been curious about since I first heard its name. This spot is known as the Oak Flat. Look around and you'll see why. The Oak Flat connects several ridges and sits between three big bowls. It's a natural crossing as well as a feed zone on good mast years. All that aside, I'd hunt here simply for nostalgia's sake. For whatever reason, when I was a kid, the Oak Flat always sounded like a great place to kill a buck much better than a place called the Sawmill or the First Valley. I'm finally acting on that gut feeling from my boyhood. On my way in, I compare the topo map to what I'm seeing with my own eyes. What's around the Oak Flat is as important to me as the Oak Flat itself. You can see here, it's just a little finger that pops out here. It's almost like a bench and then it drops off. I'm just about guarantee you that there's some deer bedded somewhere about this tip. Right as I get to the oak flat, I bump two does. I'll take that as a sign of good things to come. They probably just got my wind, but they were bedded in the shade on the north side of this ridge. The system I'm hunting with is called a tree sap, and it provides a ton of freedom when you're hunting a new location. The whole system only weighs around 10 pounds, making it easy to carry around wherever I'm hunting. Rather than having to hunt stands at predetermined locations, I can cruise the woods and quickly pop up into almost any tree that's near hot sign. You ascend the tree using a series of steps and a lineman's rope, clearing branches as you go. At the top, you attach your platform, loop a rope around the trunk, and clip in. Then, just settle in and wait. I should note that the weather has not been on our side so far. It's unseasonably warm this year. Rut or no rut, it could have an effect on daytime movement. Only time will tell. I'm riding high on my young buck encounter, so you can imagine my excitement when this mature eight point approaches just a few minutes later. Meanwhile, on another part of the property, it's been a slow day for Tatus so far, but he's never been one to give up easily. 
yesterday it was 72. Today they're saying 67, which is not conducive to movement. Of course, it's the guy who sticks up in the stand the longest is the one that usually gets the deer or the most persistent hunter. And then of course, you gotta have a positive mental attitude. And like Steve Rinella says, you gotta conjure. So I got a big buck conjured with big 16 inch tines. We'll see how we do. Welcome to the Wire to Hunt YouTube channel. We're gonna cover everything you need to know to hunt whitetail deer with new deer hunt know-how every week. Whitetail how-tos, where we provide a step-by-step -step tutorial for one important deer hunting task. Trail cameras are credible scouting tools, but they can't do everything for you. They don't care what quality of water it is, they care whether they're gonna put themselves in danger. Traps can help you read the rest of the story. Whitetail research, where we examine one study from the world of whitetail science and examine how you can use that to become a better deer hunter. The question is, does the science back it up? What does this mean for us deer hunters? Unconventional wisdom, where we take one commonly held deer hunting belief and examine an unexpected alternative because you just don't know until you get in there and you give it a real go. And I think you're gonna see better hunts because of it. Check back here every week for more whitetail know-how. It's the third morning. I'm back on the Oak Flat where I saw the nice eight point buck the first night. Hopefully there's some movement here this morning. If I remember correctly, Giannis Stax was the first one that took me to the Oak Flat. Up there, uh, three o'clock, mid-afternoon. Uh, I knew it was a good area because I'd seen in the scouting a pretty decent sized buck up there. I kind of remember him sitting next to me and I kind of whispered to him, there's a deer here. and. Uh, it was, he knew how to be quiet. He knew how to listen. He had learned that and he was very uh, good at following, uh, you know, instructions for mentoring. You're not a hard guy to mentor. Uh, and uh, I had a gun up uh, watching what was coming through the brush. Uh, it was a pretty decent sized doe. We could have taken a doe at that time. Chose not to because uh, of that situation. It just wasn't necessary. Uh, and he did not look up. He didn't look up to see what was going on. He knew that movement there could scare a deer. So it was kind of at that point in time, I said, this guy uh, knows what uh, he needs to be doing. Uh, he's in tune with what's going on with hunting. Uh, we sat up there till dark, walked back, and he had a hundred questions for me coming down the, the, down the hill. And uh, they were all good. Uh, but I'm learning as much from him now as maybe I was able to help him uh, 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 early on. And, and that's a real fun thing to experience, uh, to see that happen. I wait for about an hour before a spike crosses the oak flat. He's oblivious to my presence and offers a shot, but I'm holding out for a mature buck. And then a forked horn buck appears at the edge of the trees. Although I don't want to shoot him, I throw out a few grunts to test the efficacy of my calling. That grunt call works. 
because he was definitely real interested in it once I grunted. it. And the other nice thing about having a deer within range is every time that happens, I'm practicing. I practice getting my bow, getting my release on my string, getting in position, and then drawing as if though it were a mature buck. And uh, what was interesting there is that I, I got on him and then I made a sound to make him stop, which is, and I don't know where the hell that came from, but that's what everybody does, so I do it too. I thought I did it plenty loud enough, but he didn't even, he didn't break stride. So that's something to think about. It's like next time I might want to be a little bit louder and make sure he stops because you know, it only takes five more steps and he's behind some stuff and I, and I don't have a shot anymore. Meanwhile, the dad has moved to the far west border for the day. He's got a good feeling about the spot. After 40 some years hunting this land, he's probably forgotten more about the property than I've learned. And of the bucks killed on this property, three of the four biggest ones have been killed within probably 75 yards of where we're sitting today. That's over the last 20 years. It's the first year that it's actually seriously been bow hunted, maybe to our advantage. Let's hope so. funny because Yanni grew up hunting whitetails, but he had never hunted anything out west until he turned probably 22. So he became an expert on western hunting. And now he's moved back with the meat eater here, hunting in the Midwest, learning everything again. But that's the way it is. It's a never ending educational process. It's day five and about 15 minutes into shooting light. While sleeping in is always nice, I'm purposefully starting late this morning so that I can try a technique new to me, the bump and dump. I'm walking and trying to actually bump deer. And by bump deer, I'll find the nearest best tree, climb up into it and hang out for the day in hopes that those deer come back to these the same beds. Although I never bump any deer, I soon see encouraging sign. Two rubs within 70 yards, and a pretty nice scrape here. I'm in a, like a low saddle between two high points, so definitely a crossing zone. It's pretty wild, something I've never seen before. I just went by two scrapes and they looked old, dry, so I didn't even look closely. This one I could see there's kind of a fresh track in it and I looked up to see this uh, leaf. It's got some liquid in it. it smells like topaz, probably is topaz. So, again, it's windy and it's dry as it's been, it's warm. This doe did this here, like in the last, I don't know, 12 hours, maybe three or four hours. Um, you can see her fresh track in there too. There's obviously activity in the area, so I decided to get into a tree and scope things out. It's been a slow morning for Papa Giannis. While he is a patient man, he also knows when to pull the plug and try something else. So he's moved to the hub line for the evening, which abuts a field at the edge of the property. I, I can see younger Giannis growing into the older Giannis in the sense of the older Giannis is also analytical and, and, and sort of careful about these hunts. You know, that, that ability to examine the hunt, analyze it, and, and make adjustments on the fly, make adjustments as you need to, is, is really part of their core strengths. You know, it's not, here's where we're gonna go, 
we're going to spend eight hours here and that's what we're going to do. They, they change according to the circumstances. Uh, and it seems like that would be an easy thing, but I don't think it is so easy because uh, a lot of hunters just do the same thing over and over. They go to the same stand every year, they use the same rifle, they, they don't use cover scent or do use cover, or whatever it might be. But I think what I like about both of the Giannis is, uh, is that they have that ability to adapt. Of course, while we're waiting for the deer to show up, no hunt would be complete without a little Latvian soul food. That's what this thing is. It's called a pitox, P-I-R-A-G-S. And it's essentially cooked uh, bacon in a roll. It's extraordinarily delicious. You can't find them at your local bakery. You gotta find a Latvian. Enjoy. So far, the only action has been a rafter of turkeys picking through the chopped corn. But worst case scenario, the hub blind is perfect for an afternoon nap. Meanwhile, as sunset approaches, an eight point cuts across the ridge in front of me. Note to self, cut way more shooting lanes for next year. We hunt for three more days, but spoiler alert, neither dad nor I end up shooting a deer this trip. That's how it goes. It was a long week. I think we got hosed by those, those warm days. And that's okay. It's maybe become a bit cliche to say that it's all about the experience, but that's only because it's true. It's all about enjoying life, living the, in the moment, enjoying every day. I've been here kind of pretty much straight through for 50 years plus. And I think the, uh, the reason for it is, 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 is not the deer, the reason for it is the place and the people. All of these guys have become very dear, very close friends of mine. You know, they really are. They're all the kind of people that uh, if I need something, I know I can turn to them. And, uh, you know, so we all get together, we have a good time, then we can go home and sort of resume our normal lives. It doesn't matter whether it's a wonderful day like this or whether it's snowing or raining or you're up into your knees in mud, you still have a good time. So uh, that's what it's all about. And, uh, and it was fun to hunt with my dad, although I didn't get to hunt with him too much. I'm sorry to leave right now. These woods in this country, it's close to my heart and my soul. But I'll be back. <laughs>